Our New Testament lesson is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul wrote to this church, Our citizenship is in heaven. We look forward to a Savior that comes from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform our humble bodies so that they are like His glorious body by the power that also makes Him able to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and miss, who are my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I have two questions for you today. The first is this. What the heck are you doing in church today? Don't you know it's Christmas? Wait, what? Is Christ's birthday? That's why you're here? I thought today was supposed to be the day where everybody stayed home in their pajamas. It's Jesus' birthday. Okay, fine. But I've always celebrated Jesus' birthday by staying home in my pajamas and drinking coffee or hot cocoa and eating a wonderful breakfast brunch that my wife puts together. Why are you not at home when you totally had the option to be? Nobody would have thought less of you. Churches even shut down this morning because it was just too much. I had somebody say to me, that their church wasn't meeting on Sunday. And I said, you should come to our church. And she said, that's why we're not meeting. So I don't have to go to a church on Sunday. But you're here. And praise be to God, you are the weirdos and the crazies and the nutjobs who believe that for one reason or another, Jesus comes first. And so you're in church on Christmas, even though it's a Sunday. You didn't stay at home in your pajamas. But I have a simple question for you, and I would like you to just turn to the person next to you and answer it. And that is, you could be home, but you're not. At least you're not at your house, you're here. What does that word home mean to you? When I say the word home, what pops into your mind? Just turn to the person next to you and say, when you say home, what pops into your mind? Okay, almost everybody would have, I think, something that just pops into their head. What are some of the things you heard? Family. Mortgage. Mortgage. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Family. Uh, Mortgage. Uh, Comfort. What would you say, Jerry? The The dog. Yeah, the dog. The cat. What else? What did you hear? What's home mean? Love. Family. Good. Love. Family. The dog. Food. The mortgage. The roof over our head. Yeah, these are good things. These are good things. And I wonder if you're not in the church today because of those things. And I've had so many people, um, and the reason I started off this morning by saying um, you could be home in your pajamas, I said it three times. Is that the correct pronunciation, by the way, pajamas? That's how we said it growing up. Some people say pajamas, I don't know. Pajamas, you people are wrong. It's pajamas uh, in western New York. So for the rest of this sermon, it's going to be pajamas. So we... (laughs) 
You really don't say pajamas? Feels so bad for you. Okay. Is leading up to Christmas, the people who told me that they were coming to church said, Can I come in my pajamas? And I said, Yeah, come on. Come in your pajamas or your pajamas or whatever. And I had about four or five people ask me that. And I had one person ask me that last night. Can I come in my pajamas? I said, yeah, no problem. And the people who were not going to church because their church wasn't meeting and they didn't particularly want to meet, a lot of them said the same exact thing. Are you kidding me? I'm going to be home in my pajamas. So I got wondering, what, what is it about pajamas that means so much? Uh, why is it that we have this reference point um, that whether they were going to church or not, they asked, could they come in their pajamas? Or if they weren't coming, I'm just going to stay home in my pajamas. And I wonder this because... And I, <laughs> I thought to myself before putting these on this morning, which is not what I slept in. I need you to know that. I actually, I took a shower and I put these on and they were clean from the bottom drawer. And so, um, I, I thought, would they fire me on Christmas? But um, maybe the 26th. We'll see. Maybe New Year's. We are having church next week. The, but here's the thing about, about pajamas. They never appear on anybody's Christmas wish list. Or if they do, very rarely, right? Um, the, the, the kids, when they make their list, nobody says, I want a new pair of pajamas. Nobody. It, it, we, we think of the big ticket item. Uh, we want this. We, we want that. Even adults, what do you want for Christmas? If we're super thoughtful, we go, oh, I want world peace. Or I want you know, harmony and all this sort of thing. Or if we're honest, I want that really big thing that I didn't have before. But nobody says a pair of pajamas. But yet, when we talk about Christmas, and especially being home for Christmas, we reference these. Why? Why is it when I get off of work, I go home and I want to, especially when it gets colder out, which is insane because it's in the 70s here today, um, but when you go home, what makes me want to get out of my work clothes as fast as possible and not put on a pair of jeans, but put on these? Because isn't it what they are warmer? What comes with this, isn't it the things that you just named? Like warmth and you remember these, like this thing that nobody ever asks for still connotes and, and is full of all these different meanings. And I think that there's something to that. That maybe we connect pajamas and Christmas because Jesus does a lot of the same things. If you think about it, the original gift that we're talking about today is Christ. It's, it's Jesus. And when he was given, people in his time had wish lists. The Romans, he was born into a time period when the Roman Empire ruled the world. They had their wish list. They wanted control of their territory. They fought wars at the edges of all of their territories to maintain it in his lifetime. They wanted their currency to be very valuable. They, they wanted power. They wanted prestige. They wanted to be recognized. And then the people that were under the heel of this Roman Empire... In particular, Jesus' own people, the Jewish people. Well, they had their own wish list. Many of them wished for a Messiah, but that had military implications. They wanted a Messiah, an anointed one, a king. Kings were anointed. They wanted an anointed king to literally ride a horse into Jerusalem, the holy city, and establish that as God's dwelling place forever and throw out the Romans and make God's home among people once and for all in a military style. That's what they wanted. That was what they put on their wish list. And instead, they got Jesus. They got a baby born 
in a stable or a cave or whatever it was and placed in a feeding trough, nobody could have said, that's exactly what we wanted. And those two groups colluded in the end to kill him. Clearly not the Christmas gift they wanted. They didn't re-gift. They didn't just put it aside. They put it in the trash. It went straight to the curb. Wrong gift, sorry. Not what we're looking for. But what is it that, that Jesus brought, really? He said he brought a lot of what the Jewish people were looking for. He said, remember, we just talked about these last night, all through Advent, John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and made his home among us. In Matthew 1.23, God uh, fulfilled in Jesus the writing from Isaiah that the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That, that God's kingdom, Jesus himself said it. When he started his public ministry, he said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. That Jesus himself said that he brought God's rule. He was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. But his rule when he brought it looked a whole lot different than anybody thought it was going to look. What he brought was into a world that was broken and ravaged and hurting. He brought comfort. Like we said at the beginning of the service, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. And of course, to those who thought that they were at peace and comfortable, he brought conviction. He said, actually, no, do this. And the good news of Christmas is that he is still giving you the gift you may not ask for, but you need. That God is still with us. God is still among us. And God is not ruling from a throne or implementing military power. But power is happening and the kingdom is still growing. Bit by bit, little by little, because Jesus is still wrapped all around us like a nice pair of pajamas. And I want to acknowledge on Christmas Day that it does not feel that way. Not all the time. In the weeks leading up to Christmas, I have amplified and talked all about the wonderful, uh, life-giving stuff that's happened with Advent Conspiracy and the Habitat Project and how it's changed everybody's Christmas. It's been wonderful and amazing. But at the same time, as those loud voices have been going out of praise and transformation and excitement, there is always this undercurrent at Christmas of people who are saying a different story, and they never say it loud because they don't feel like it's right, because this is supposed to be a time of joy and happiness and all that sort of thing, but I've had conversations. I've talked over the course of the last month with three widows who all lost their husbands in the last 12 months. With two married couples who by all appearances to the outside world look like they have a healthy, happy marriage, but who are absolutely at their wits end with each other and don't know what to do. With two moms of special needs children who find themselves at their wits end. With new parents who have the bouncing baby on their knee, who represents baby Jesus to everybody else, ah! and they're going insane. Because the baby is all-consuming. And there are the people that we never seem to talk about. The lonely. The shut-in. The people who are just too old, too aged, to be able to get out and do what they want to do, who feel and say to me, I feel like I'm useless, and I'm just here. That Paul wrote these words 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And we trumpet these words at on Christmas Day because we feel like it's supposed to be a time of joy, but it's so important to remember who he wrote it to and where he was. He wrote this letter to a persecuted church, to a church that was hurting and in pain, in anguish, who was really being attacked by everybody in the world around him. And he said to them, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always in all circumstances. And he himself was in prison Rejoice! Rejoice in the Lord always! And what is his reasoning for why you can rejoice in the Lord always? It's simple. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. God has made his home among us. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and that is never, ever, ever going to go away. And so like Jesus, I want to say to anybody here whose life is not ideal, just hear that promise of comfort on Christmas. And what Paul said is not, you know, hey, everything's going to be rosy and wonderful. He said, make your requests known to God. He never said that they would just happen. What he promised is God is near. No more, no less. Experience that comfort. Know that no matter how far you feel from from home or how lost or how hopeless you feel, you are never, ever, ever alone. And for anybody here this morning who has just had the most blissful, amazing Christmas morning ever and you plan on going home and just skipping through your day because your life is amazing, Seek out the people whose lives aren't. Be convicted. And take your joy and your presence and your peace like Jesus did into their lives so that they don't just hear in their ears, you're never alone. But they experience in their homes, in their hearts, in conversation, that reality with actual people who love them because Christ first loved us. So I don't know your personal reason for being here on Christmas. To me, this is home. Especially for a guy who's from New York and says pajamas and, um, and will not be with his family at Christmas time. This is home. You, to me, are a warm pair of pajamas. Be that to the world. Amen.